We're on our way to Washington, D.C. for the 4th of July. Our first stop on the way was Eisenhower's Presidential Library. We are left with two key impressions about his presidency. Everyone seemed to like Ike, and he faced the challenge of slowing the spread of communism without starting a war. Korea, the death of Stalin, Hungarian revolt, the Fidel's revolution in Cuba, the first Sputnik launch, all these happened on his watch. We were surprised to find a museum on Winston Churchill in Fulton, Missouri, where he gave his Iron Curtain speech. The museum was an excellent summary of his life. Springfield, Illinois, we visited the Lincoln Museum and Library. This is a relatively new facility designed to provide an entertaining summary of Lincoln's life and legacy. It almost felt like a Disney creation, designed keep, to keep children interested in the subject. Next stop, Fort Necessity, Pennsylvania. Here we visited the Washington Inn, built in 1827 as a way station on the road, as well as the recreation of Fort Necessity. George Washington was patrolling the area when he encountered a French patrol and killed 10 of the French, the first battle of the French and Indian War. This year marks 150 years since the Battle of Gettysburg was fought. The visitor center has been significantly upgraded since we were here last. The film which illustrated the whys and wherefores of the battle, followed by the Cyclorana, a 360 degree painting of the third day of the battle, painted by a French painter in the late 1800s. But best of all was the bus tour, because we could picture each day of the battle on the original train. For example, it was amazing to find that on day two, the little round top with its commanding view of the battlefield was undefended. The Union Army arrived only 10 minutes before the Confederates attacked. On day three, General Lee, having failed to flank the Union Army, decided that the middle of the line must be weak, and thus that was the place to attack. This was the site of the famed Pickett's Charge, 12,000 men strong. Francis DuPont decided to collect American decorative arts. He expanded his mansion from 30 to 175 rooms to turn it into a museum. This room was paneled with room panels from a 17th century home. Here's George Washington's presidential china set. The power of the house was designed to fit the Chinese wallpaper he had found on a visit to France. When the room was found to be too short, he curved the walls into the ceiling so they didn't have to cut the wallpaper. Here's the original staircase from a southern mansion that was going to be demolished. In the dining room is an incomplete painting of the sign of the Treaty of Paris ending the Revolutionary War. The British refused to sit for the painting. Outside were numerous gardens. The enchanted woods had recently been added for all the visiting school children. The next day, we took the Chesapeake Bay Bridge to the eastern side of Chesapeake Bay and the Maritime Museum in St. Michael's. On our way to Virginia, we visited Fredericksburg Historic Section. Our first stop was Mary Washington's home bought by her son, George. At the Rising Sun Tavern, we learned the wise behind several familiar expressions. Bottoms up, here's looking at you, and he's not playing with a full deck. The James Monroe Museum had many artifacts, swords, his rifle, various writings, and the desk he used to sign the Monroe Doctrine. Yorktown Visitor Center had a 18th century garden and kitchen exhibit, as well as a military camp. The museum presented the story of the Revolutionary War, which ended here in Yorktown. Then we went on to Jamestown Settlement. Outdoors was a typical Powhatan Indian village with numerous oblong lodges. They also had a replica of the fort built in 1607, including the governor's residence, which was fairly plain. Finally, they had replicas of the three ships that made the 144-day trip to Jamestown, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery. 
Colonial Williamsburg is set in the years just before the American Revolution. The Capitol building housed the House of Burgesses on one side and the Governor's appointed advisors on the other side. We visited several trades, including the millinery and the silversmith. The styles of these things would change often, so customers would bring in their out-of-style or out-of-date items into the silversmith. He would melt the silver down, remake it into a new style. So that's how he was getting his silver, was from you, the customer, here. Coins were brought in. You had a job. You had some extra coins in your pocket. There were no banks you could put your extra coins into. So you could bring your coins in here. The silversmith would melt your coins down and make a, a bowl or a spoon or a cup or something for you out of your money. And then you can use your money this way, right? You could save your money. If you needed to buy something, they would weigh this. And if this weighed more than what you were buying, they could chop the handle off and give that to you as change. That was cold, hard cash. So it didn't matter what your money said on it that made it valuable, but matter what your money weighed and what your money was made out of, which was silver, okay? It takes about a couple of hours to make a spoon that size. It takes over 200 hours to make the coffee pots. Our most interesting house was the one built by Peyton Reynolds, who was president of the Continental Congress. In the kitchen, we saw an automatic spit called a clock jack invented by Leonardo da Vinci. The governor's palace was meant to impress. The main hall was filled with swords, pistols, and rifles, which could be removed from the walls in less than an hour if needed. We headed for Washington, D.C., stopping at Mount Vernon on the way. The house itself was much like we remembered, a large house for the time. A large museum has been added since we were here last. Inside was a lot of Washington furnishings, from farm tools to his presidential chair to the presidential china. The next day was the 4th of July, which we spent on the mall. Two Smithsonian museums, the parade, the folk festival, the Capitol Fourth concert, and finally fireworks. This performer is one of the true legends of American music. He's been called the showman of our generation. Please welcome Barry Manilow.
After sleeping in a little, we headed off the noon annex to the Air and Space Museum at Dulles Airport. In this huge hangar were many historic planes that are too large for the mall, as well as the shuttle Discovery. The Enola Gay dropped the first atom bomb on Hiroshima. In the afternoon, we visited Arlington National Cemetery. It's still in the 90s, so we walked the minimum, up to Kennedy's grave sites, then the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. We arrived at 358, just in time for the changing of the guard. On Saturday, we had planned on visiting the various monuments, but it was 88 degrees at 9 a.m., so we opted for air conditioning at the museum. The exhibits were quite varied. Headlines from the 18th century till now, a movie about the first years of the First Amendment versus the Sedition Act, and lots of interactive exhibits. But the exhibit on 9-11 and the Pulitzer Prize winning photos probably captured us the most. That night, we visited the Jefferson Memorial and drove by the Lincoln, World War II, and Martin Luther King Memorials. We headed off for Shenandoah's National Park's Skyline Drive, and then it continued for the next three days along the entire length of Blue Ridge Parkway until we reached Great Smoky Mountain National Park, a total of 600 miles, lots of scenery, but the hit of the trip was the Blue Ridge Music Center near the Virginia-North Carolina border.
In Smoky Mountain Park, we drove to Cades Cove. This was the site of a small mountain community which started in the early 1800s until the park was created in the 30s. Several homestead cabins are maintained as well as community churches. On the way home, we continued our presidential tour, stopping outside Nashville to visit President Andrew Jackson's hermitage. Many feel he was the first common man elected president. Then on to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. Not a particularly pretty cave. It is famed because there have been over 400 miles of cave found in five layers on only a seven mile square area. They keep finding more passages. Last year they found eight miles. Our last stop was the Harry S. Truman Library. Three months after taking office, Roosevelt died, leaving Harry as president. Harry had many challenges, from dropping the bomb on Hiroshima to the Berlin airlift and Korean War.